and you can get lung fibrosis uh, as a result. The other one, so IBD associated, if you've just got other autoimmune stuff going on, um, and then reactive arthritis as well. And the way to remember this one is you can't see, you can't pee, and you can't climb a tree. Um, so you get uveitis, you get urethritis because it's painful um, when you're peeing, and you can't climb a tree because you have arthritis, yeah? Um, and the reason this happens, it's like an autoimmune thing where the body gets confused. Um, you've just had an infection, usually like one to four weeks ago. It's typically an SCI. Sometimes it's a gastrointestinal illness. Um, your body makes antibodies against them, fights it, it's all gone, it's all clear. And the next thing you know, it's starting fighting your own joints because your own joints look similar. So that's, that's worth knowing. Um, mechanical back pain. Now, this is more like a GP thing. You'll cover this more next year um, in much more detail, but it's worth knowing. So osteoarthritis can impact your back, uh, and it does this at the facet joints, which is the only place in your vertebral column where the two um, bones basically link directly. And this is that in the picture. And, but if there's mechanical back pain, your other red flags are vertebral compression fracture, particularly if they have osteoporosis, um, and metastatic cancer. Dude, you might want to check this out because it's doing funny things again. Sorry. Um, and then there's neuro stuff, which you've had your neuro lecture, so we won't go too much into that. Sorry if you're watching at home and it's screwing up. Um, vasculitis. Okay. So this, this is not like buzzwordy SpongeBob. This is different SpongeBob. Um, but vasculitis is a spectrum from small vessel disease to like large vessel disease. Um, we don't need to know all the vasculitides. Um, we just need to know like the basic concepts and you can just like understand this through first principles. So if it's small, you're going to get, um, well, you typically get like palpable purpura and peripheral neuropathy because it infects, uh, it, it affects like your nerves and things um, versus large vessel disease where you can probably hear it if you put a step on it, you know, ischemia, buoys, these kind of things. Um, it's usually very vague kind of presentation, but typically you get pulmonary renal disease. Um, typically, it's inflammatory, and usually we just solve it by giving cred. Incredibly niche meme. Um, <laughs> anchor associated vasculitis. So this is what we do actually need to know. Um, so anchor is something called anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody. And, yeah, I know it's terrible. And um, this is a small vessel vasculitis. Okay, and this uh, there's two types of anchor you need to know. There's C anchor, which is cytoplasmic, and there's P anchor, which is perinuclear. And they target different things. What they love to do in EMQs, I, God knows why, is like to not give you C anchor and instead to give you like this weird molecule and stuff. But you need to be able to make that link. So know off by heart which goes with, with which. Um, often, as you know, you've just had your nephrology lecture, so you're all you're, you're hip to this. Um, you get you know nephritic syndrome and things. Um, when you take a biopsy, it's pulsy immune. You don't see anything, um, and you solve this by giving pred, just like most things. Uh, this was like my summary of, of the different anchors. Like the main one you need to know is Wagner's, uh, which is this one, which usually gives you nephritic syndrome and it's C anchor and it's like granular and just information. So know that one. Temporal or giant cell arthritis. So this is super, 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 super important. Um, this is one of the big room emergencies. We've already gone through a couple of them, septic and osteo, uh, septic arthritis and osteomyelitis. This is the other big emergency that you need to know. Um, so this is a large to medium vessel vasculitis, uh, and it affects much like gout, how it has a very specific kind of demographic. This is much the same, where you get um, females older than 50, and often they have PMR, which is like a shoulder problem, which we'll get to that as well. And the symptoms which you should know off the top of your head is they get a temporal headache, they get scalp tenderness. So you can ask, you know, when you comb your hair, is it tender? Does it hurt? They get a change in vision, often something called amaurosis fugax. So this is where you have like the unilateral, you know, dark descending curtain. Um, and there's a few differentials for this. This is getting more forth here. You'll do this more in GP. But if you're interested and importantly, you want to do that like a straight down one. Um, and then the other symptom is jaw claudication. Is there pain when you're chewing food when you're having lunch, dinner? Um, it can also affect extra cranially. So um, it can affect your subcranial artery. And this is where you get limb claudication. Don't need to know much about that. On examination, they may have a tender temporal artery. They may be carotid bruise. Often they don't. Often it's completely normal. Um, and the, so then we do investigations. ESR is through the roof. This is really important. This is buzzwordy. Um, and temporal artery biopsy. Now, there's a lot of confusion around this. So you take, an, uh, you take a sample of the tempor temporal artery not because it's more likely to affect that. And to be honest, not because you're more like worried about that than any other artery. 
I'm more worried about the ophthalmic artery because you don't want them going blind, whereas the temporal artery, not too big of a deal. But this is just easily accessible, so that's why we do it. Um, and you can see all this under the microscope. It's got a low sensitivity. It's like, for example, like how many of us are wearing red? I can say like two people. Um, but imagine like taking a sample of like you guys and, and say you're not wearing red. Oh, no one here is wearing red. Like that's not, you know, that's not very, that's not very comprehensive. And this is kind of a similar kind of concept. Um, so we're going to treat even if we don't have the biopsy. Um, we're going to give you high dose PRED, um, oral usually, or IV if you're already getting vision symptoms and we're really, really worried. As well as They're well, racing each other. This all helps like dumb down the inflammation and telling the body to stop doing what it's doing. Um, and if you don't do this, well, they can go blind and it's irreversible. You're so it's hot. Like stuff. you're physically any you. Headache, history, any headache, um, station you're getting rusty, which you might be like, aha, this is neuro. Well, it could be this. So watch out for that. Um, PMR, as we've touched on, so this is when you get bilateral joint stiffness, um, usually at the shoulders and the pelvic girdle. Um, and your CRP ESR is up because it's inflammatory. Um, and you want to rule out uh, muscle myopathy going on or fibromyalgia, which is more a pain syndrome rather than a stiffness syndrome. We'll get to that. And the big amazing thing with this one is if you give them low dose PRED, like it fixes them like this and they will love you and pick your genes. Um, so it's important to give them that but also important to screen for the temporal um, arteritis symptoms. Fibromyalgia, so we don't need to know this too much for um, in med school, but this is more a real life thing. Uh, this is like, it's a weird thing where you get your CNS just becomes oversensitive to things and you get particularly usually patterns of neuropathic pain um, for reasons we don't understand. It's often related to um, having room conditions or already being in some level of pain and also often related to like psychological distress and pain. Um, and so they're often like really non-specifically diffuse and tender in all sorts of areas of the body. But when you're like, oh, let's investigate this, everything comes back normal. So you're, that's when you're thinking uh, fibromyalgia, it's a uh, diagnosis of exclusion. Um, and you fix, and, and sorry, you manage this in like very kind of fluffy, you know, mindfulness spray has kind of ways, um, but you also give neuropathic payment. So the ones we talked about, tricyclics, SNRIs, gabapentins, because this is really effective in this disease. So we've talked about a few. So it's important to know like how they present and how they're different. So PMI, as we said, is mostly a, a problem of stiffness in your joints. Um, adhesive capsulitis, which we haven't talked about yet, but that's also a stiffness one. Whereas polymyositis is a muscle problem. So obviously we get muscle weakness, yeah. And fibromyalgia is a pain syndrome. Um, so it's important to be able to differentiate those. Okay, Ooh, that was a lot. Okay, polyarthritis. So bringing that all back. So this is how I would approach a polyarthritis kind of station slash presentation. First, you want to rule out any connective tissue diseases going on. And these are the ones I would think about. Then you want to quickly rule out like, is this gout? Um, it's kind of rare, so you can probably rule that out fast. And then you want to think about your other stuff, so your spondyloarthropathies, um, PMR, and then obviously osteo if it's mechanical. Um, so that's that's what you can do. So let's uh, put that to to use. Ankylosing spond. Jack, please, you didn't like me from the second I walked in here. I'm a very accepting person, Parker. All I ask for is... Cool. Any takers? Thanks, Bon. That's a good take. We'll go with that. Um, yeah, it is x -Bond. Yeah, it is x -Bond. Now, the like sus thing is like there's a bit of radiation. So you might be thinking, is there something like neurocompression, disc herniation type thing going on? Um, it's not below the knees. And like looking at this patient's demographic, a young male um, and restricted hip movement. So it's, you're thinking x -Bond. So that's really good. Okay, this is hopefully easy. <laughs> e? Yeah, E, we like that um, because it's, uh, it's lupus. It's lupus. Um, so we want to do the specific test for that. Yeah, we could do an ANA, but that's sensitive. That's not really going to help us rule in. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
G, yeah, G. So this is um, the antiphospholipid syndrome, which we talked about in lupus, um, which very typical, you know, miscarriages, um, getting, you know, hypercoagulable, having all these issues. Um, that's, yeah, that's, that's that. Yeah, yeah. So, so if, I, if like this is what I drill, want to drill into you, please don't be like naive and say, "Oh, I want a temporal artery block because we talked about that. Um, aspirin you can start as well, but steroids is your like main um, thing that's going to help. Cool. Any um, questions, queries about polyarthritis slash connective tissue disease stuff? No. Okay. So we'll press forward. This is good. Um, so fractures, fractures, fractures. Um, Types of fractures. So this is a real life thing that was like, or at least to me, was like never really properly taught in med school. There's a lot of different types of fractures. Um, the ones that you should know that are a bit weird. So an open fracture is one that's like coming out of the skin, literally. It's also called a compound fracture. That makes no sense to my brain, but just memorize that because that radiologists call it that. Um, a comminuted fracture is when you have multiple pieces. Um, so basically three or more pieces because the bone breaks up. Um, and a green stick fracture is what you get in kids because the bone is kind of bendy and you kind of half break like the side of a bone, um, but it's not like a full, full break. Um, so those are some types of fractures, but I would know, have like a vague understanding of that. Um, interpreting an x-ray for a fracture, this would be a super mean OSCE, but like they could do it. Um, the mnemonic I made up, not a great mnemonic, but the, no mnemonic, <laughs> the mnemonic I made up was say CAD JB, I don't know why. Um, but this is like, I thought it was a logical, uh, guys, I thought it was a logical flow. Come on, back me up. So you want to start off seeing like, where is the fracture? Uh, where along the bone is it? What type of fracture is it? Um, is it a compound fracture? So is it open or not? Um, angulation and displacement, which are two different things. Angulation is like, as you may guess, like it's the angle at which the distal bone is relative to the proximal bone versus displacement, which is like, how much has it shifted kind of horizontally? Again, the distal bone relative to the proximal bone. Um, even though this picture is kind of confusing because it should be the distal one being located. But anyway, um, is there joint involvement? So this is a really important question because of course we, by this point we know all about septic arthritis. Uh, we want to be on top of that if it's happening. So is, does the joint space look okay? If it doesn't, then we want to really do something about it. Um, and then if you're getting excited, you can possibly suss that if there's osteoporosis kind of going on, even though that's not the test. Um, other kind of considerations, so how you would manage it, have some kind of basic framework. This could be an OSCE, it literally could be, and it's just the stuff you'd expect, like painkillers, um, you can cast, brace, splint it, physio, you can get the OT involved. If they need surgery, then, then they can have that too. Complications of fractures slash injuries in general. So you can get rhabdomyolysis, and this is where the muscle starts breaking down like crazy. Um, and this is bad because it creates all these like electrolytes and compounds, which can go and damage the kidney and give you an AKI. It can also give you DIC, which is nasty and nobody wants that. Um, and your CK will be through the roof because your muscles breaking down and you want to do all this other stuff as well. And it's important to know um, that this can be an adverse effect of statins, which is super common and everyone's on them. Um, but this can happen very, very rarely, of course. But the other one is a compartment syndrome. So typically this is at your long bones, a shaft fracture at your long bones. Um, and you get your five, six Ps, whatever it is, pain, pressure, paresthesia, pallor, pulses, all that stuff. Um, and uh, what this, what's basically happening here is fluid is getting into that compartment. It's building up. Because it's building up, it reaches a point where it blocks your vessels. It, it like um, stomps on your nerves. It just blocks everything. And then the fluid just keeps building up and it's a nightmare. Um, so obviously you want to elevate the limb. You want to remove any tight clothing they have, give it some breathing space. And if they need a fasciotomy, then then that's what you're going to do. Anatomy, I'm not going to go through this, um, but it, this is here if you want to look at it, if you want to revise, this is there for you. Uh, yeah, all good. Brachial plexus, so I still think this is worth knowing, at least in vague terms. Um, and the important thing which is actually going to be worth marks is the humerus association. So if you have a fracture or an injury along the humerus, um, at which point along the humerus and like which nerve does that correspond to, does that correlate to? So the auxiliary nerve is usually at your surgical neck and you should know like auxiliary nerve, you know, regimental patch, also the buzzword. Median nerve is usually more distally. Radial nerve is um, at the radial groove, which is along the shaft. And ulnar nerve is usually the medial 
medical, medial epicondyle, my apologies. Um, upper limb fractures. Okay, so we like we already know all this clavicle fracture. It's usually like two thirds of long slash, you know, around there. And you're worried about your subclavian vessels. Um, a fuchsia fall on outstretched hand. So you can get a Colley's fracture with this, um, this, which is a fracture of your distal radius. And the thing you get with this is a genet fork deformity, which you can see in this picture. And this can impact your median nerve, okay? Um, a scaphoid fracture. So this is where you get, uh, where you can get proximal avascular necrosis, which is proportional to how proximal it is, right? Because the blood flow goes backwards. Um, and the more proximal it is, the more at risk it is. And the sort of important real life point slash, I think I've seen this in an EMQ or two as well, is you can do an X-ray thinking, oh, there's a fracture here and it looks completely normal. And this, this can happen, like it looks normal for a couple of weeks, even though there is a fracture. More squid word, we'll just we'll let that slide. Um, low limb peripheral nerve. So this, this I think you really should know and you should memorize it and you should know this. Um, because how, this is at least how I learned the anatomy. Like just think about compartments, think about compartments in your thigh and your calf. And, and lower leg. Um, so your femoral nerve does your anterior thigh stuff, your obturator nerve does your medial thigh stuff, your sciatic nerve does, so the motor part does your posterior thigh, the sensory part does your posterior calf, um, but then that splits into your fibula slash perineal, those two are synonyms, and your tibial nerve. Now your fibula slash perineal nerve, there's a deep component which innovates the anterior calf in terms of motor innovation, and the sensory innovates the web between your first and second toe, which sounds super specific, but it's worth knowing because that's a favorite to come up. And the superficial uh, component of the fibular nerve, which does the sensory dorsum of your foot and the lateral calf in terms of motor innovation. Um, and then your other nerve from your sciatic is your tibial, which does your posterior calf in terms of motor, and then the sole of your foot, so the, the bottom of your foot in terms of sensory. Um, yeah, so, so, so know that because that actually does come up. Well, in fracture, so a NOF fracture, um, also confusing, we call the hip fracture, even though it's kind of not exactly. Uh, the typical thing you get is an externally rotated and shortened leg, okay? Um, and you get on x-ray a change in the Shenton's line. So this is a normal Shenton's line here, uh, and this is like a broken Shenton's line. Um, and if it's an intracapsular or subcapital fracture, then um, this artery gets damaged and you can get avascular necrosis of your femoral head. Um, and then fibular fracture slash ankle fracture, like we know this, you know, Weber classification, but it's there just to, for you to revise. Soft tissue injuries, uh, this is more like a real life thing. Just know the basic definition. So, you know, when your friend says, oh, I have had a, a strain or a sprain, like you don't get confused and you know what you're talking about. Obviously, soft tissue, so ultrasound is the way to go in terms of when we're having a look at that. Management is very similar to, kind of similar to fractures in a way but just have some kind of basic conservative management um, outline in your head, just so you can like reel that off as well and then ask you if, if it's relevant. Shoulder stuff, so rotator cuff, so this is also a favorite on many levels. So if you have rotator cuff tendonitis, then your limited, um, sorry, then your active range of moment, movement is limited, okay? Um, and there's four muscles, as we would know very well by now, your sits muscles, um, and how I like to go through this um, on examination as well is you just go systematically through them. Supraspinatus, so you do the empty can test, you check for painful arc. Infraspinatus and teres minor, which do the same thing. You can test that with external rotation. And subscapularis, which you can do your lift off test. Um, so you can just do that kind of rhythmically. And then this is uh, in comparison to adhesive capsulitis, also called frozen shoulder, where your both your active and passive range of movement is limited because um, it's like a um, fibrous kind of thing, which just limits everything. Cool. So injuries, fractures, bring it all back. So how, like the big points from this, um, I would think about getting a history of the incident. Um, is there a wound going on? Because of course, that's another consideration. Um, are they currently bleeding? You know, infection risk, tetanus, all that kind of stuff. Um, examination, obviously you want to check the vitals. Are they stable? Um, have a look at the place. Is it swollen? Is it inflamed? And then you want to suss out your structures. Like, is there any arterial compromise? How are the muscles and tendons doing? Um, and then nerves as well. You're getting any shooting, stabbing pain. You know. So you can ask about that. And then the investigation, obviously, if they're worried about a fracture, then you do an x-ray of soft tissue, then you do an ultrasound. So that's straightforward. Okay, EMQs.
Take us for the first one. Is it pain? It is pain. Because, um, so we went through like how the pathophysics, yeah? Um, and you get that kind of buildup of fluid. And before that can compress your nerves or vessels or whatever, you get pain. So that's the first thing. That's very good. Any takers on the next one? Okay, I'll put you out of your misery. So this is, this is kind of more of a common sense one. Like if you imagine, if you visualize what's going on here, his leg is angulated at 60 degrees. It's literally up in the air. It's pale, it's cold, it's not looking good. You want to get that leg down, yeah? So you're going to splint it in a neutral position. Um, you might think about calling surgeons and doing all that kind of stuff, but first you want to start off with your basics. Um, if, you have, if you're seeing this scene unfold before your very eyes, you know, that's what you're going to do, okay? There's a lot here. This is upper limb questions. Cool. Um, any ideas with our 17 year old female? Median, yeah, exactly. Because this is, um, this is, yeah, so everything is describing that. It's a dinner fork deformity, Collier's fracture, median. And if you look at like what's actually going on, it's very, very median now. So that's good. Any ideas with the next one? Uh, e? Yep, E. So this is a painful arc. Um, and yeah, so it's a rotated cuff, probably supraspinatus, because that's a common one. Yes. Uh, true, yes, but I still think this is the best answer because that wouldn't change anything. Um, you because frozen shoulder, you would it, it wouldn't be pain, it would be restricted, yeah, yeah, but good pickup, good pickup. Any other questions, queries about that one? Okay, um, oh, yeah, what is painful arc? So, you mm. just tell it's a rotated arc, you can tell which muscle. It's usually supraspinatus. Um, I mean, that's usually the culprit in most um, rotator cuffs, to be honest. I think it's more specific for that. Potentially, it could be others as well. Not too sure. Yeah. Um, and then last one, which if you've seen it, you'll know it. If you haven't seen it, you'll be like, what is going on? Um, so this is your flexor digitorum profundus. The important learning point here is it's the deep one, the profundus, um, that goes to your distals. Uh, that goes to your, like, your distal final bone in, on your fingers. None of the other ones do that. Um, so this is one they like to um, test, to ask you about on the interviews. Lower limb. Yeah, so this is the one I warned you all about. Um, yes, it's common perineal. And if you're really nerdy, you can go even further and say it's your deep um, rather than your superficial branch. But yeah, that's what it is. This is very incubable. They, for some weird reason, they love to ask us. Cool. Any questions, queries about fractures or any of that stuff, injuries? No. Okay, well, let's, let's move on. This is good. We're doing well. Um, bone health. So, uh, this is, so this is now the endo stuff, yeah? Um, osteoporosis. So this is where we're at. So we know this, we know osteocytes um, are in the bones, osteoblasts make the bones and they ultimately turn into osteocytes. Uh, stem cells we don't have to worry too much about. Osteoclasts are basically modified macrophages which reabsorb the bone. Um, vitamin D has like this whole fun adventure in the body. So it starts off so from the sunlight at the skin, um, then it needs to go to the liver to be processed, gets processed by the liver, then gets uh, thrown away to your kidneys, which then converts it to its active metabolite form. And even though it's called a vitamin, it's actually a hormone. So surprise. Um, osteoporosis. Okay, so this is very, very, like you really need to know this, very common OSCE station. Um, it came up a couple of years ago, um, and you should know this back to front. Um, so the risk factors, so low sunlight, low calcium, smoking, 
Um, and then you want to suss out like primary or secondary. So for postmenopausal females, it's very normal to lose bone health. As you can see from this graph, you reach your peak around age kind of 30, 35, and then that falls in both sexes, but in females in particular, with your estrogen going down, you get that bone loss after menopause. That's usually what osteoporosis is. However, you do want to make sure that there's nothing else sinister going on. And there's loads of secondary causes. How I remember it is GRE, so GI stuff, so malabsorption stuff, basically, renal stuff, which is multiple myeloma and just chronic kidney disease, um, and then a bunch of endo stuff. And I just like go down the body. So start with your thyroids. Your thyroid or parathyroid can, can be overactivated. Then go to your pancreas. Um, with, for some weird reason, type 1 diabetics get this, but type 2s don't. We don't really know why. There's a lot of research going on there. Um, then you go to your adrenals. So this is your um, cortisol, which can be high, which can be because we're giving you, uh, we're giving you steroids. Usually this happens, uh, you get side effects after like three months of at least 7.5 milligrams of PrEP. Um, that's usually, when you get above that, then you start worrying about that. And then Cushing's, which is the body's like natural way of too much steroids. Um, and then lastly, if your gonads aren't working. How we diagnose this, there's a couple of ways we can diagnose this. Diagnose this. One way is a DEXA scan, uh, usually not the hip or lumbar spine. Uh, we know, you know, you compare it with your normal distribution. T-score compares to like healthy young individuals around that kind of 30 age mark. Um, it should be more than negative one. If it's less than negative one, then you're osteopenic and it's not good. If you're less than negative 2.5, then that's by definition osteoporosis. We all know this. Um, the other one is your Z-score, which kind of looks like an S. So it's for secondary osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, my bad. Um, and this is where you're comparing not with that healthy peak, which we just discussed, but you're comparing with people who are actually your age and therefore um, you, should, you, know, you should be keeping up with them. If you're not keeping up with them, then there's something secondary sinister going on. That's one way to diagnose. The other way is if they've had a previous, what we call a fragility or a low trauma fracture. So a fall from a standing height. Um, if I walk out the stair and I fall, that it's gonna hurt, but like I'm not gonna fracture myself. I shouldn't fracture myself. If I do, it's, it's sus. Um, also, if you have a vertebral compression fracture on your spine, where you have a crush or a wedge fracture, and that's also diagnostic. Okay, management. So this is like where the big money marks are. You, should, you, need, to, you need to be able to reel this off. Uh, so you want to, broad principles, you want to increase the vitamin D, you want to increase the calcium, uh, you want exercise, you want smoking cessation. Um, so you can give them supplements for both the vitamin D and the calcium. Um, but for vitamin D, obviously, you want them to get sunlight. For calcium, obviously, there's dietary stuff, milk, cheese. Here, I'll give you a handout. Um, exercise, two things, weight-bearing and balance. Weight-bearing increases the strength in your bones, increases the density, sorry, of your bones. Whereas balance, you're thinking more about falls and falls prevention, which is what we're really worried about in osteoporosis. And smoking is not good for your bones, so you should try and stop that. Uh, medications, we only do one at a time. We don't add on. Um, and most of these are teratogenic, so we don't want to give them to, pre to pregnant women. Um, you start with bisphosphonates, which, are, which essentially inhibit your osteoclasts. Um, the guidelines say you should only do it for five years, um, unless you're high risk, because there's other side, of, side effects and stuff. And paradoxically, you can get atypical femoral fractures, um, and very rarely, like, you can get osteonecrosis of the jaw, which is super rare. Um, we're not going to give this to people whose kidneys are not doing well, e.g. far less than 30. Um, or if they have like serious dental work going on because we're worried about that osteonecrosis of the jaw. You can give this in two ways. Normally how we give it is an oral medication where you take it once per week on an empty stomach and you have to tell them be upright um, for 30 minutes because they're going to get some like burning and esophagitis and we don't want them um, to have that. And the other alternative is you can get zoledronic acid, which is an IV infusion once per year. Um, so you can offer that as an alternative as well. Uh, if we're not doing bisphosphonates, we're moving on usually to denosumab, also called proli in real life, uh, monoclonal against rancor. Every six months, you come in for an injection. It's easy, pretty much the same side effects. However, because um, you're giving an injection, oh no, sorry, never mind. Um, and the other one you can give is raloxifene. We don't do this very often. It's more real life. Kind of, it's not really much of an exam thing. It's an oral medication, and it's only usually for vertebral. Uh, osteoporosis and it increases your clock risk which is why we don't do this because we don't want people getting heart attacks or strokes um, and then your final like you know you've you've fought this you're trying you fought this monster you're like inventory is running out and then you get onto your teriparatide which is the big guns um, it doesn't make any sense it's recombinant pth 
if you try and logic it out in terms of how this would work, it makes no sense whatsoever. My suggestion to you, don't even try because it'll get confused. Just memorize it. Um, it's an injection you give once per day and it's only for really severe kind of um, osteoporosis. And that has a clot risk as well, which is why we don't like to give it out like there's no tomorrow. Um, and obviously with all osteoporosis, we just, we're worried about uh, fractures. Falls, okay, this is not technically on your matrix, but I think you should know it for real life. Slash, it also, believe it or not, came up in an OSCE a few years ago where you have to do a falls risk assessment. Like what on earth is that, right? Uh, well, this is what it is. Um, so falls, falls are important because the most common cause of hospitalizations, even in our age group, super, super common. Uh, and it's often people fall and then they fall again. And it's often like this downward spiral. Um, they can be mechanical or non-mechanical falls, and it's important to differentiate between the two. Are they having syncope or have they just tripped? You know? um, and often they might not be able to get up afterwards. In terms of how I would go about a risk assessment, neuro and MSK stuff basically, think about their motor function, think about their sensory function, um, think about orthostatic hypertension. This is a common one, like you know, you're lying down, you're asleep, then you get up, you feel really dizzy, you fall. Um, ask them if they've had that. And then also cognitive problems, which increase your risk as well. And then obviously if you're having osteoarthritis and, and uh, then that's bad. And if your bones are weak with osteoporosis, we want to know that as well. Uh, you can do this get up and go test on examination, but importantly, you should test their balance with the birds. You should test their vision and hearing because this is sensory input, which allows us to like be stable. If that's impaired, you can fall. And how you would manage slash prevent this same thing as osteoporosis, but you want to think about also footwear, eye checks, a personal alarm as well. Osteomalacia, so this is uh, different. So even though it's a vitamin D slash calcium deficiency, this is a failure of the mineralization of your bones rather than just your bones not being as dense. Um, and if this happens in children, then we call it rickets and you can get bow legs and knock knees um, and all sorts of things. And you just basically, you have pain usually, unlike osteoporosis. Um, your calcium and phosphate's down, your vitamin D's down. Your ALP is usually up, and you can do a more specific test called the bone-specific ALP, and that's usually up as well. Um, your DEX is still down, but it's different to osteoporosis. And again, we're just worried about the same stuff with fractures. Paget's disease, buzzword, buzzword is hats. So uh, you get this focal bone remodeling, where there's like this wave of osteolysis, and then your body tries to recompensate for that and, and tries to put the bone uh, osteoid back, but it's like really disordered and like mosaic is a buzzword happens in older people um, and you get bone deformities um, and you know tip, like your head your skull expands and all this weird stuff so that's why like your hat doesn't fit anymore um, for some weird reason that's the EMQ. Um, your AOP is up again you can do the x-ray you can see what's going on there um, and you want to fix this by giving calcitonin which decreases your serum calcium but also bisphosphonates um, and you're worried again about the same kind of complications really bone tumors um, Sorry, bone tumors. Um, this is all pure buzzwords. I know uh, Jesse's gone through you know, PATH and all the buzzwords with you, but if you want another person's summary of the buzzwords, this is mine. Use it if you want, know the buzzwords. Okay, osteoporosis. So putting all this back together, this is so history exam investigations management. Hopefully you, ha you um, have some sense of how to do that and don't forget falls and how you would kind of think about that as well. Okay, EMQs. Any takers? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but obviously there's more going on than just that. So she's had, so first of all, she's external, it sounds like she hasn't had enough a neck of femur fracture. Um, and it was a fall, she fell on her, tripped on her dog. So it's a fall from standing height. This shouldn't give you a fracture. Um, so that's really sus. It's probably osteoporosis. So this is getting like really into physiology. Um, I'll just go through this. So the answer would be, it would be B, B or A, sorry, confusing myself. A, increased 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Increase. Um, a. Uh, so you get increased uh, parathyroid hormone, and that impacts your three, um, your guts, your kidneys, and your bones in this kind of way. If, if you're not familiar with the physiology, we can uh, you can go through that. Cool. So this is sus. So you shouldn't have lytic, multiple lytic lesions in your spine. Um, this, this isn't just normal osteoporosis. This is multiple myeloma going on. Um, so yeah, so B is the answer there. Cool. All right, last section. We're sort of, kind of, sort of running in time, not really. Um, so any questions on that? No, okay, I'll move on. Cool. Room exam. So what you would do on an OSCE, so this is good. If you're falling asleep, start paying attention now because this is important. Um, so you do your general inspection, you check for AIDS or orthotics, do they have bruising or bleeding, you're thinking about steroid use there, do they have any rashes, thinking about connective tissue diseases. Um, the mnemonic that I just drew for this is ask for the field to measure special tests. Measure you only do on your spine and hip exam pretty much, um, but that's important to know. Uh, for look, I go with mass deformity um, and you can go through that and you can use that if it helps you, but if you've got, you know, you're in year three, you probably have your own system, that's cool. Uh, feel, I go with TEP B, you can do your own system, that's fine. Um, uh, yeah, you guys all know this. And if you're feeling super, super extra, I wouldn't actually do this, but you can mention this um, if you're doing an exam. You can say, oh, I'd like to ask take the heart and lungs for signs of serositis, um, which is very extra. Don't actually do it, but you can mention it. Um, hand exams. <laughs> I'm, I'm really providing with the bad mnemonics here. So go Rapunzel. Which is felt is like there's a Z in Rapunzel, like it's so bad. But this is this is what I came up with. If you could come up with something else, we'll, we'll go with that. But until then, it's Rapunzel and she's gone. Um, so this is what you go through on a hand exam. We got a hand exam last year, and to be honest, you could probably get it again. Like this is a very good thing to test your three knowledge. Um, so you go through each disease and say, no, I can't see any gouty toe fight. I can't see any Bouchard's head in the nose, squaring of the thumb. I can't see any of this. I can't see any of that. Um, you say, I can't see any of your crest. Don't say the E because you can't see esophageal dysmotility, but you can see everything else. Um, and then, yeah, so you, like you need to have this in your head so you can completely reel off all of this stuff because that's how you'll score well on a hand exam, which I'm still going to say is very likely to come up. Nerve testing of the hand. So you should have some idea of this by now. Um, there's three main uh, nerves. And this is like, this is where like Sandy and Spongebob become one because it's very testable on the uh, OSCE. It's also really important to know real life, yeah? So your three main nerves are your radial, your median, and your ulna. There's a lot of different ways to test the motor. The ones I go with are, um, so for radial, thumbs up. Uh, for median, okay sign. Which you can see, so you're looking for that circle, which you can see in poker face Lady Gaga, but not in the telephone Lady Gaga, because it's like this, so that's a median nerve palsy. Don't know what she's done, we won't go into that. Um, and then your ulna nerve, which is make a star, yeah? Which is like abduction of the fingers. Uh, and then there's from inside as well, which is more an EQ thing. Uh, and then you need to know the sensory test. So this is of all the nerves as well. Straight from tallies, um, your median nerve, you can just pick maybe the index finger. Um, your ulnar nerve, maybe just pick the pinky. And your radial nerve is the anatomical snuff box. So know how to test that uh, because they can easily combine this with a room hand exam, with a neuro upper limb exam, like just with anything. They might have had an injury in coming for an OSCE. So, so know how to do this, it's important. Explaining your medication, this is also something that's not really taught, but I think this is also where SpongeBob and Sandy become one. Um, the, mnem <laughs> the mnemonic I made, I think I'm improving with these mnemonics. Uh, I, I just chase them. Um, so this is what I go through. This is what I go through. The indication why they need this drug, what actually is a drug, basically how does it work, any contraindications or interactions with other drugs they might be taking, how do they take it, how often do they take it, um, accessibility, which is important in some drugs, like do you have to have your asthma puffer with you at all times, for example? Um, and like, what happens if they stop it suddenly? Is that gonna be an issue? So we need to think about that. Side effects and adverse effects. Um, if it's an oral thing, like you can just fluff your way through it. Yeah, you'll get some nausea, stomach upset, but then you wanna think about the specific side effects of that drug as well. Emergency considerations, so any particular red flags they should be looking out for, um, if they should be wearing like a medical alert bracelet or band. Um, and then monitoring. Do they need to come in for monitoring? How often are you going to monitor them? What blood tests are you worried about? Are you worried about liver, kidneys, you know, what is it? Pred. So I think this is the drug you should really know if there's any. Um, and I've gone through the whole 
you know, I'd chase them with it. So you can look at that in your own time. Obviously, PRED causes a lot, a lot, a lot of issues. Um, specifically, another one of my mnemonics, MC Boys. And this one you can actually use for Cushing's as well because it's the exact same thing. So you get metabolic syndrome, cataracts, easy bruising, uh, bleeding and bruising, osteoporosis because it thins your bones, you're immunosuppressed, and you can get sleep, sleep and mood disturbances, which is why we take it in the morning so it doesn't impact our sleep. Um, and if you stop it suddenly, you can get an Addisonian crisis because your body's not able to, your adrenals can't like compensate rapidly enough. Um, so that's a problem. So you don't want that happening. So you want to explain that to them. Cool. So we're really coming to the end of this, which is good because my time is up. Um, how I would go, like, first of all, you'll all be fine. You're here, you're studying, like don't stress, um, but have some sort of approach. So I would learn all the differentials for the main presentations. Um, and this is really what's gonna come up in your OSCE. It's no longer like, here, do a cardiovascular history. It's more specific than that, and you have differentials in your head. And that's the only way you can really structure it. What I did to prepare was write down literally every single presentation that could come up ahead of time, and just make a list in your head. So you have some kind of structure, and you won't be completely thrown when it comes up. Um, and I just put that in a doc, which I've put on the, the Google Drive. You can use it. Um, uh, like it's not so much more about how I've structured it. It's, it's the presentations themselves. Um, it's a word doc, go in, edit this, have fun, like make your own approach to it. If you want to use mnemonics, use them. If you don't want it, it's fine. If, you, if you're anatomical, physiological, like however you think about it, it's okay. Um, just prepare for all of those presentations, I think is the important takeaway there. Sorry, people at home. Um, and cool, so once you're done with exam and stuff, this is a really good interview that Michelle Leach gave which I, I, I would really listen to this, particularly if you identify as a woman. She talks a lot about like her own kind of journey through med, how she got where she did, um, things she's learned along the way, um, seeing this really nice story she tells about seeing the first like female consultant and she's like, oh, I didn't know females could be consultants and things like this. Um, it's really good, you should listen to it. Um, other things we're really reaching the end, general like life advice and stuff, not that anyone asks. So um, advice about exams. So how I like, like to think about it is in medicine, like you're bombarded with information, but you want to learn it forwards and then you want to bring it back. So you want to go in depth, learn everything you can about rheumatoid arthritis. Then once you're done with that, say, okay, I'm done. With, like have a summary, have like a really basic summary and basic understanding that, you, that is just in your head. And then you can always go back to that kind of mental space. Um, so you have to bring it back. You have to summarize, you have to make it basic. Because to be honest, medicine's pretty basic. Like, don't make it more complex than it needs to be. 